A few years ago, maybe even a year ago, if somebody had said, Ron, I think you're going to do a science fiction picture one of these days, I probably would have said, no way, because I'm interested in the characters and I'm interested in the story that those characters have to, have to tell. Okay, everybody looking? Adjust your mask, Wilbert. Despite his prediction, Ron Howard has just finished directing the Zanuck Brown production of Cocoon. But what attracted Ron to the science fantasy is just what he was looking for, characters. Reminds me a lot of uh, the, the, the old Twilight Zone formula, which was take relatively ordinary people, throw them into a bizarre situation, and uh, see how they respond. Jack, this is the chart I was telling you about. Is this land? What is this? Well, this is actually an underwater configuration map. It's a heat-sensitive map. Oh, I've seen these. It's, it's a brand new development. Japanese have this. Yeah, that's right, Jack. The Japanese right. new development. The story of Cocoon concerns a group of humans who become involved with some mysterious strangers. They're making me very curious about you. When the humans find out that these strangers are from another planet, the adventure just begins. What's the problem, Jack? She's not normal. There's something very abnormal about her. We're telling a tale, but we're getting to use these characters that you're not used to seeing. And I think that makes it much more entertaining, much more interesting, much funnier, um, and much more exciting, too, because I think, I think you're really going to be rooting for those folks. The folks Ron Howard is talking about include some of the acting profession's most renowned practitioners. Besides Tony Welch, Steve Gutenberg, newcomer Tyrone Power Jr. and Brian Dennehy, the cast includes such veterans of stage and screen as Hume Cronin and Jessica Tandy. Why don't we dance? What? Oh, sure. Donna Michi and Gwen Verdon, Wilfred Brimley and Maureen Stapleton, Jack Guilford and Herta Ware. I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, you're not going to dance with me, that's one. That's for sure. That's for sure. When I was growing up in the theater, I mean, they were in the pantheon of, of, uh, of theater sainthood. And to, uh, to work with them, to have the opportunity to work with them, and, and even better, to have the opportunity to get to know them on an individual basis has been a once-in-a-lifetime deal. And I'm just so delighted that it could happen. And just walking out onto the set every day and seeing these people, it was, uh, I was just awestruck all the time. It was over four years ago when producer Lily Feeney Zanuck first decided to turn a then unpublished novel into the movie Cocoon. I think initially when you choose material, it has to be more than an, infa an infatuation. It has to be something that you can fall in love with uh, so that over a period of time, dimensions of it unfold as opposed to a one night stand. This labor of love involved meticulous planning from detailed storyboards for the special effects sequences to training actors to dive underwater, as well as gathering and training wild dolphins. They kind of know that you're afraid of them if you are. And I, I was a little bit taken back by them. And they, um, they grabbed me a little bit, and they nudged me, and they poked me a little bit. And they look almost, when they get back and they look at you, they kind of are smiling that you're afraid of them. They know they're not going to hurt you, but they kind of get enjoyment out of you thinking that they might. Uh, we've got dolphins, uh, we've got a lot of members of the cast, we have a lot of story threads running through. They're just, and we have a lot of different locations. Uh, so there's, there's a lot to worry about in terms of the making of the film. Months before principal photography began, the magicians at George Lucas's Industrial Light and Magic were already hard at work designing Cocoon's special effects. Down right there. You got it. You always have to try and outdo what you've done in the past, and uh, also just out of uh, just a simple state of you know, getting bored by doing the same thing over and over, you want to try something different all the time. And so I'm always looking for a new approach, not perhaps a new technique, but a new look to things. The story itself has so much to it that you could almost never show the aliens at all and it would still work. And the extra magic that we're putting in this film is, is 
going to make it, is really going to push it that much more and really make it, a, I think, a wonderful film. What the hell are those? All the actors were confronted with physically demanding roles, particularly those actors whose characters find physical activity getting easier. But once they start swimming in the pool where the cocoons are stored, the characters' lives change in remarkable ways. I feel tremendous. I'm ready to take all the world. Oh, oh. In the case of Steve Gutenberg and Tony Welch, the cocoons lead to a very close extraterrestrial encounter. Don't touch me. Don't touch you? What's the big deal? All right, I want to tell you the truth. You're not my first Ontarian. I'm not naming names, Jack, but... go to the other side of the pool. The Ontarians are not that alien, really. I mean, they're, they really are more human-like than, than most aliens that you normally see. So they're, they're much more emotional than you would probably expect an alien to be. In Cocoon, the Ontarians learn what it means to be human. What do we do tonight? We'll help you. And because of the adventure they share together, the humans discover the rewards of taking a risk. We'll never be sick. We won't get any older, and we won't ever die. Grandpa! Wake me! I'm in my This film is about hope and love. It's about things happening that are, that are good and joyous, and, 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 and the world, the future looks bright. And I think people are going to walk out of this picture feeling real good. In the next shot, you guys can kind of back yeah, we, off. Yeah, and, and you know, as he's going like on about the fourth push, you can just kind of start to back off. Yeah, we really Although he's only 31, Ron Howard has been in the business for 29 years. Action! Cut! Excellent. Okay, print that. Born into a theatrical family, he became best known as Opie on The Andy Griffith Show and is Richie Cunningham on Happy Days. Andy Griffith tells me that he, that he, remembers, um, he remembers my saying um, that I wanted to be a director a long time ago. He, he says that, that my pat answer to what do you want to do when you grow up always was, I want to be an actor, writer, producer, director, cameraman, baseball player. You should be working real hard and getting the dive equipment ready. That, you and Mike. Ready to do it, Ron never did become a baseball player. Because at the age of 15, he made up his mind to become a director. Do we need to get over there to... Uh... I just yelled it across and everyone nodded their heads, a great deal of authority. So those who got it will explain it to those who didn't. Following the success of his last film, Splash, Ron has just finished directing the science fantasy, Cocoon. For me, this has been a very ambitious project because there are several different kinds of movies. Um, there's an action movie in here. There's a, a very small kind of uh, sensitive movie in here. Uh, there's a comedy in here, which I understand very well. I'm very comfortable with that. And there's an effects picture, it's fantasy. This is in order. You are endangering the lives of your passengers. The story of Cocoon concerns a group of humans who join with some visitors from another galaxy in a rescue mission. Don't let them board us. Nobody's going to board this boat. You just get your friends here. Ron can easily identify with the risks these characters take because as a director, Cocoon is his most ambitious film to date. I have dreamed about this movie in one way or another just about every night since I started. So I know that the complexity of the project uh, that I'm really feeling, it. there's a real payoff for being ambitious. And that, that payoff is really, I think, why everybody's in the business, uh, and or at least why I'm in the business. It's, it's real. It's, it's very exciting, really exciting when, when you meet a challenge and kind of pull it off. Yeah, take a look around. Boat sleeps eight, so you should be pretty comfortable. And if you've got a latitude and a longitude, I can get you there. And if you don't, I can still get you there, so. so we know a great dive spot, and we have a map. In the new 20th Century Fox release, Cocoon, Visitors from another galaxy rent Steve Gutenberg's boat in order to retrieve some cocoons from the bottom of the ocean. You need a hand? No. No, thanks, Jack. We're doing fine. Excuse me. 
This meant several actors had to learn to scuba dive, including Brian Dennehy, Hume Cronin and Wilfred Brimley, Jessica Tandy, and Tani Welch. Their teacher was actor and diving instructor Mike Nomad, who had trained Ron Howard to dive during the filming of Splash. This is a very dangerous sport because you're dealing with deep water. And the way I train people to dive is to set up boundaries for them that I know they're never going to be able to do in the first place. Because as their instructor, what I have to teach them to do is to recognize and respect their own human limitations. It's just not like diving in your swimsuit in a swimming pool. When you put on full diving dress, it's heavy, it's bulky, it's awkward and it throws you off balance. And having your peripheral vision shut off and having a single air source is a tough thing for a lot of people. And just being in that wetsuit, you start to perspire and you just get exhausted inside these things. Because you end up waiting. And I, you know, I don't dress people till the very last moment. You just can't afford to have somebody sitting around in that wetsuit because they'll, they'll just be whipped by the time we're ready for a shot. If you pay attention to the rules and do it properly, it's no problem. The, the difficulty is that we're wearing these outrageous costumes. And uh, the combination of the underwater costumes and the fancy gear that we have to carry, uh, is it's a little difficult to be graceful. Adjust your mask, Wilford. Once the actors had learned the basics in a swimming pool, Mike quickly got them into the ocean where they were easily distracted by this new and intriguing world. In the ocean, there are so many beautiful things out there to look at. It takes their mind off the fact that they may be drowning. See, they, th they think, I'm going to drown. I'm never coming out of this alive. Oh, look at that pretty fish. Isn't that beautiful? You get their attention off survival, which is what they're all worried about in the you know, initial training process. And nothing fascinated the actors more than the dolphins with whom they would have to act. They got very excited when we came down and they were pew, 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 back and forth. And then coming up out of the water and then going back down. And, and they'd, they'd look, you know, like a really jovial sort of creature because they seemed to be grinning the whole time. They just strike me as being very happy. The first time I was in the water with them was at night. And being in the water at night with nine elephants is like, and especially in their turf, it's kind of scary. And they're the only animal I've ever been around that has a that has a true soul. You know, a dog has a soul, but they kind of look at you and they're kind of, you know, puppies type. But the dolphin looked at me, all the dolphins looked at me like they really knew what was going on. They were really aware and they were, they were having a good time knowing that I was scared of them. I'm performing for, for some it, with some t pretty tremendous a actors, you know, and it, 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 it's like running, you know, in a tremendous race. You got to really keep up. What I like mostly as an actor, I am with very fine actors. Boy, I think they wrote the acting business. On action, you go. Straight out that way. And action! Both Steve Gutenberg and Jack Guilford are sharing a unique opportunity. They are acting together in the new 20th Century Fox release, Cocoon. Okay, everybody looking. <laughs> a film that brings together performers who are just establishing their credentials with actors whose credits have won them world praise. Come on, turn that money will bring you no pleasure, I promise you. You just try and sleep tonight. I'll sleep like a baby. Besides Gutenberg and Guilford, the cast includes Brian Dennehy, Tony Welch, Mike Nomad, and newcomer Tyrone Power, Jr. I, for one, don't believe this alien crap at all. You don't believe your also starring are Maureen Stapleton, Jessica Tandy, Gwen Verdon, Hume Cronin, Wilfred Brimley, Don Amici, and Herta Ware. It's a wonderful cast. Uh, you've got maybe 400 years of experience there combined. Cocoon is directed by Ron Howard, a veteran actor himself. But even he was a little intimidated at first by the thought of directing so many famous actors. Hume Cronin called me on the phone and he said, now I know I'm old enough to be your grandfather, but you have to be like my dad in this situation. You know, you're the director and I'm, and, and I'm the actor, so tell me what you want, Ron. Jesse and I have reached an age where with 50 years experience, people are inclined to treat us with undue reverence. And that can be very lonely. We just do the job. <laughs> I mean, we just 
open our mouths and say the lines the best of our ability. It's a profession. It's a job. I mean, I don't say I'm going to the theater at night when I say I'm going to work. Over the years, these veteran performers have approached their profession head on. And in the process, they have defined what good acting is. But even though they downplay their achievements, their reputations still impress the other cast members. Walter, I thought maybe you, you guys had got the hell out of here already after what happened today. I came by to tell you I'm sorry. And they've passed the stage of being worried about their careers. Now it's just the work that counts, and the, and the artistry. And uh, it's, it's been a, that has been a wonderfully satisfying and interesting part of this picture. I still haven't figured out how to play human beings, and here I am playing uh, an alien. Actor Brian Dennehy, along with Tawny Welch, Mike Nomad, and Tyrone Power Jr., play Antarians from the planet Antaria, which is in another galaxy. What's the problem, Jack? She's not normal. There's something very abnormal about her. But creating these extraterrestrial visitors in the Zanuck Brown production of Cocoon was strictly an earthbound task involving meticulous planning. If you're doing a special effects, you're, you're really dealing with fantasy elements, basically. And you'd think you can get away with anything. It's a fantasy, so anything goes. But that's not true. Everything has its own sort of reality it works in. When you're on Earth, people are used to seeing things on Earth. And uh, so if you throw something in it, it is completely different. It's a real interesting design problem on how to make it work within that, that uh, environment. We ran the gamut from, from creatures that were basically bald, uh, feminine-looking human beings to entirely um, abstract forms of energy that uh, almost didn't relate to a life form at all. And we really settled on something that was, that was very gentle and, and not entirely human, but not entirely unhuman either. Well, I hope you're not going to take your skin off, because I really like skin on a woman. And they're adult aliens, and it was a lot of fun working on them. Because you could impose on them what you would hope would land in your backyard. Once the filmmakers decided what the Antarians would look like in their natural state, they had to find a group of actors who, when put together, would suggest something not quite normal. We make a few mistakes here and there, and we don't dress quite right, and we, you know, the little things are wrong. In, in just the way we act, but there's no big physical. I mean, we're, we're playing aliens who are here as humans and, and trying to um, be as, as human as we, as we can. Well, how does an Ontarian express affection? We show ourselves. All right. The Ontarians are not that alien, really. I mean, they really are more human-like than, than most aliens that you normally see. So they're, they're much more emotional than you would probably expect an alien to be. When you're playing a character like this, anything that you do is presum presumptive. It must be presumptive. Uh, we don't know what a, a non-human person would be like, what they would act like. Uh, so it's, it's all made up out of human uh, guesswork and uh, imagination. Just put it down the back of the way, please. I see Walter as a, as a computer which is forced through circumstances to have to slow down and operate at a much slower pace. So just relax. Well, I don't want to relax. Why don't you let us explain? Because I don't want to know anything. And if you try to eat my face off or take over my body, you're going to be very sorry, mister. You're going to be very sorry. Face eating, Jeff? I've never heard of that. Is that uh, some sort of delicacy? No. Forget I ever mentioned it. I would hope that I would always be able to keep the concept of, of an otherworldly creature in my mind. Um, I would love to believe it's true. I think it's presumptuous to believe that it's not true. I just can't imagine that we're all alone in this big universe. This ability to even fantasize that there's somebody else makes you wonder if there wouldn't possibly be somebody else.